Welcome home, everyone here to Unity Chapel of Light. <laughs> and if I haven't met you before, I am Reverend Judy Elia, and it is my very first service in the Chapel of Light. <laughs> I'm so happy that we're resurrecting together today. And we know that whether you are here in the physical or whether you are connecting with us in cyberspace virtually, that we truly are one. If anything has been taught to me during this time of the COVID separation, it's that I actually really can connect with people who I am not physically present with. It's been the most amazing experience, seriously, for me, who is not a technologically savvy person, to learn to do things because it kept me alive. It kept me connected to people I couldn't have seen otherwise. It showed me their faces. It helped us to heal this incredible trial that we've been through for the last year, year and a half. And so what I want us to say today to each other is we resurrect together. That we are resurrecting together. So for those of you who have never been on Zoom, this is Larry Smith and Christine Cordon. So we are in for a treat today. Will you please honor us in doing our opening song? There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well Jesus has overcome And the grave is overwhelmed the victory is won. He is risen from the dead, and I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise on eagle's wings before my God
rise. This is Charles Fillmore, our co-founder, and it is that we must rise to the conscious realization that every thought of mind, every atom of body, every molecule of being, every function of nature, and every force is divine. Can you turn to each other, whether you're here physically or on Zoom, and say, we rise. we rise. You are divine. We are divine. This is the resurrection. There is no other. Jesus told us, I have overcome the world. We celebrate together. We rise. One more time. We rise. And we affirm, I welcome my resurrection experience. Let's say that together. I welcome my resurrection experience. Letting go of fear. I say yes to God. Letting go of fear. I say yes to God. And again, I welcome my resurrection experience. I welcome my resurrection experience. The last week of Jesus's life, he gathered his friends together and he said, I've told you everything I know, there are no secrets. And I call you friends. Because there's no greater love than this, than to lay down your life for your friends. He must have known that his death was imminent. And so he said, everything I have told you, I have told you because I want my joy to be in you and I want your joy to be full. And I want to leave my peace with you. And if you can do this, if you can love one another as I have loved you, then that's how they'll know you're my friends. Jesus wasn't a Christian. I know that sounds funny to some of you, but that wasn't a word he ever heard in his lifetime. In unity, we teach that there's a difference between Jesus and the Christ. The Christ is a word that means anointed. The Christ is an attainment and certainly Jesus attained it. People were flocking to him from all corners of the world and he left no one out of his circle of love. Think how extraordinary that is, that 2,000 years ago, when you could get stoned for talking to a man at the well who wasn't a part of your sect, a woman could get stoned to death for something like that, that Jesus did that. He talked to women, and he gathered children and women to him. And there are teachings that were buried that are being unearthed now that speak a lot more to that. What's contained in what we call the Bible is what men long after Jesus died decided went in there. They called it the canon. And there's historical evidence that they actually fought for some things to be included and some things not to be included to what they called in those days fisticuffs. Think about it. These events happened in Turkey, what is now Turkey. 
And we are left with a very beautiful historical document called the Bible. But we also have all these other Bibles that people risked their lives to bury. The Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas, <laughs> the Gospel of the Marys, all the Mary Gospels. We have so many epistles that were written that were left out for various reasons. So in unity, we choose to use both a literal and a symbolic and what we call a metaphysical interpretation of the Bible. So we take it all in because some things actually happened the way they said they did. If they're in all four gospels, they probably happened that way. And there are other things that got lost in translation. You know the joke? The priest goes, you know, to heaven and he gets the original copy of the translation of the Bible from St. Peter at the gates. He opens it up and he goes, <gasps> celebrate? I thought it said celibate. A lot gets lost in translation, right? And I know that because I've studied Sanskrit. I actually went, uh, I wanted to read the Pantanjali Yoga Sutras and the Upanishads and even the translations from Pali to Sanskrit of the Buddha. I wanted to read them. So I wanted to unlock that code of Sanskrit. And in graduate school in three weeks, this brain <laughs> had to learn the entire Devangari script, script. And if you've ever seen Sanskrit, you've probably seen the Om like this. One dash in Sanskrit changes something from peace to not peace. And I just thought, oh, that's brilliant. You know, because how many times have we missed the mark, literally missed the mark, right? And got the translation completely wrong. Another thing about translation is it's in the eye of the beholder. You can only translate something at the consciousness that you receive it, at the consciousness you're at, okay? I'll tell you another story about translation. I have a Chinese friend, my dear friend, Julia, and we met at a Tai Chi seminar, a residential Tai Chi seminar in Oregon, some really obscure place in Oregon that we all had to travel far to get to that was very remote on the water. And I thought I was doing Julia a favor by giving her the Chinese version of the daily word. And she opened it up and she burst into tears and she wouldn't speak to me. <laughs> Julia, what's going on here? And she said, I came over and, you know, during the cultural revolution and I became a model in LA and and I, everybody was so mean, the Christians, they were the meanest, you know, and have you been saved and blah, blah, blah. And we're like, Julie, I'm sure that doesn't say that in there. Yes, it does. And so actually we had bad translations of our daily word in Chinese. They were being translated by Chinese Christians of the fundamentalist variety. So I go, Julia, I want you to write down every word that says, and I read to her what it said in English, because she is fluent in English, of course. And then she read to me what it was in Chinese and I was livid. I was so mad. So we don't translate in Chinese anymore. We don't, we don't have a daily word in Chinese because we don't know anyone that can translate daily word in the words they would need to be translated into in Chinese. We'd have to find an enlightened being, right? We have to find someone who could understand metaphysical Christianity in China. And that, I mean, this was 20 years ago when that happened. So, or a long time ago, anyway, I don't know how many years, but, um, but it was very telling to me. I wondered how many daily words we had abusing Christians in the world because we didn't know how to translate them the right way. You know? Charles Fillmore said this about unity. Unity is a link in the great 
educational movement inaugurated by Jesus Christ. Our objective is to discern the truth in Christianity and prove it. The truth we teach is not new. Neither do we claim special revelations or discoveries of new religious principles. This is very important to understand. My mom taught me this as a kid when I went to one of those, you know, born again, huge things for teenager in a, you know, big stadium where, where everybody is in frenzy about Jesus Christ. And I came home and my best friend and I had our crosses and my mother who never really said much about religion or spirituality to me ever said, don't think that because you have a cross on your wall, you are better than anybody else. That is not a Jesus Christ teaching. And since I'd never heard my mother have anything to say about religion, it stuck in my mind. It made an impact on me. And I had to really think about the Jesus that I was taught. Love your enemies. Bless those that cursed you. May my joy be in you. The Jesus that taught prostitutes and criminals, tax collectors and tax evaders. And I have come to really love that Jesus, that Jew who died and rose and came back in a different form that wasn't recognizable to people. From the 20th chapter of John, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed. She ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciples and say, said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've laid him. You know, prior to that, most of Jesus's friends, the people he called friends before he died, were disowning him because they were afraid for their own lives. They were hiding behind locked doors. Simon Peter had denied him three times in one day. They were scared. There was only a few people that walked with him to the end. His mother, Mary the Magdalene, Salome, Joseph of Arimathea, his brother James, and possibly one or two other people unnamed were at his cross until he died. Another thing that was a revelation to me as a Christian was that Jesus was not special in the fact that he was crucified because such a big deal is made out of his crucifixion. Thousands, I am talking thousands of people were crucified during that time period. He was not special in that. It was a kind of torture that Romans had perfected. So Jesus wasn't a Christian. That word would have not ever been uttered in his time. It was actually a sarcastic remark. It meant one of those Christ followers. It didn't mean one of those Jesus followers because Jesus actually, his followers called themselves the Jewish sect of the Nazarene or the saints, the brothers and sisters, the disciples, the followers of the way. Never Christian. That term was first recorded when they were stoning Stephen long after Jesus had died, resurrected and ascended. As a sarcastic remark, we just don't know how it became a movement. We don't know. Probably Rome had something to do with it. But that's our job, isn't it? If we are unity. Unity means educational movement. That's the way it was founded, never as church. 
Unity is unique in that way because you don't have to believe anything. And we're here to trust the spirit within you and your own brain to think what you think, to feel what you feel, and to be who you are, all that you are. And we're here to support each other in that. And at the same time, to be of one accord, to agree to disagree. That is unity, isn't it? It's a very important force in the world to not have an opinion so strongly that you hate someone who doesn't share it. That is not a Jesus Christ teaching. Jesus said, what? Bless those that curse you. Love your enemies. Love everyone like I loved. I've overcome the world. I've overcome all these grievances and differences. The force of love. Gandhi called it ahimsa, the soul force. This is the most powerful force in the world because it overcomes the world. It's the only thing we get to take with us. Love never ends. Prophecies come to an end. Bodies come to an end. Thought forms come to an end. Governments come to an end. All kinds of trials and tribulations come to an end. Love never ends. And I testify to that. So I had a near-death experience in a car accident when I was 16. And that was what was shown to me. I looked at my life, the past before my eyes while I was clinically dead, like watching a movie. Ah, could have been a little more loving there. Hmm. Yeah, missed the mark there. <laughs> you know? But it wasn't from guilt or shame or fear. It was to be more loving, to be kinder, to be a better person, to be more Christ-like. In the book of Thomas, one of the earliest on earth Dead Sea Scrolls, it says, Jesus said, the kingdom is here. It's within you and it's all around you. If you think it's in the sky, the birds are gonna get there quicker than you. Awake, arise. Life is a gift and we're all invited to the heavenly feast. that's always occurring right here and right now. I'm so happy to be here with you. <laughs> I don't know how to end this, <laughs> except maybe with the affirmation that we began with. We are resurrecting together. Like Phoenix rising out of the ashes of fires, evacuations, not being able to breathe quality air last summer being terrified and all the people that were being lost every day from the coronavirus, we are rising like the phoenix out of the ashes. We're resurrecting together. From your heart to the heart of everyone who's here, let's just know this for each other. We're here for each other. We're here to hold the high watch for each other and for our children. I'm so happy that you brought your children today because I really want to support the families and the children who've been so isolated, so deprived of other children this last year. We have this beautiful playground. Let's see it filled with kids. So let's rise one more time together and say, I welcome my resurrection experience. I welcome my resurrection experience. And I welcome you here, everyone. I welcome you here with all my heart. Happy Easter, everybody. <laughs>
So Larry and Christine have, I got my mind made up as a song for us. <laughs> got my mind made up and I won't turn back cause I want to see my Jesus someday I got my mind made up and I won't turn back cause I want to see my Jesus someday goodbye world I stay no longer with you goodbye pleasures of sin I stay no longer with you I made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life I made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life I got my mind made up and I won't turn back cause I want to see my Jesus someday I got my mind made up and I won't turn back cause I want to see my Jesus someday Bone of the water, spirit in the blood, thank God I'm born again. Bone of the water, spirit in the blood, thank God I'm born again. Jesus! Name so sweet. Emmanuel! Name so sweet. Jesus! Name so sweet. Emmanuel! Name so sweet. I got my mind made up, and I won't turn back, cause I want to see my Jesus someday. Rock me rock upon Jesus, Jesus name so sweet. Every rock me rock upon Jesus, Jesus name so sweet. Every rock me rock upon Jesus, Jesus name so sweet. Every rock me rock upon Jesus, Jesus name so sweet. I've got my mind made up and I won't turn back because I want to see my Jesus someday. upon his face, there to sing forever of his daily grace, on the streets of glory, let me lift my voice, all my cares are past, home at last, Charles Fillmore in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary he has like, I don't know, four pages on Jesus. And one of the last things he says is that we will see Jesus again. He told us that he went to prepare a place for us. And I think he meant that literally. I'm giving you my translation, so don't take it literally. <laughs> but Charles Fillmore says something similar to this, that when we raise our consciousness to the consciousness of Christ Jesus. We will see him face to face. I welcome you all back to unity. And um, I'm so happy to meet you in the physical. And now we will have a um, closing song with precious Jesus. I 
Take my hand, precious Lord. 